Majority Report on the phone. A pleasure to welcome back to the program Professor Emeritus of International Relations and History at uh, Boston University, the president of the Quincy Institute, Andrew Basevich, author of his latest, The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's let I mean, obviously, there's been a lot in the news that uh, I would like to touch on. But let's just start with the uh, the 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 broad strokes of your book. And I suspect that much of what has happened, uh, not just in the last couple of days, but frankly, in the past, like a month or two with the release of the Afghanistan papers, um, uh, you know, further your, your premise. But you, you argue that in the, uh, in the fall, the, 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 or I should say the end of the cold war. Um, and, and, and you credit, uh, George, George Herbert Walker Bush with having a, um, an impressive understanding of how the world worked, uh, but uh, an inability really to articulate any type of vision going forward, that uh, American elites basically pushed a, uh, a four major sort of, I guess, um, uh, premises, global uh, globalized neoliberalism, a militarized hegemony, radical individual autonomy, and presidential command. Um, let's just... Uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, those and 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 how we see those playing out. I mean, the, I think we, we we talk a lot about globalized neoliberalism on this program, but let's talk a little bit about the militarized uh, hegemony. Yeah, and I think I think it's appropriate given the moment that we're in. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, American elites, both civilians and military officers, persuaded themselves after the Cold War that we had become militarily supreme. Uh, the, the only other superpower had collapsed. And so from a military point of view, we were king of the hill and could do what we wanted. That led to, in my judgment, a, a dramatic transformation in the rationale for American military power. During the Cold War, the idea was to prevent World War III, to deter to, to make sure that uh, the Soviets didn't take over uh, Western Europe. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the idea became to put American military power to work to fix problems. Uh, and that line of thinking was very much uh, in evidence in the wake of 9-11, when the George W. Bush administration launched this global war on terrorism with uh, enormously optimistic expe- expectations of transforming much of the Islamic world. You know, fast forward to January of 2020, we're still stuck in that war, uh, and but we have a president who, having promised to get us out, uh, seems to be getting us in that much deeper with the assassination of the past week as evidence of that. Um, let, me, let me just I mean, question you a little bit on those. I mean, the, I, I mean, I understand the characterization of our military as being a, a bulwark a, a, against um, the, you know, within the Cold War. But ultimately, isn't there a consistency between what we ent- we, we really looked for to, to our military to do then as we do now, which is to protect um, the financial interests of people who had the most amount of influence within this the, this country? Um, and and how they would maintain those interests uh, abroad? I don't think I'd agree fully. Uh, I mean, it is it is certainly the case that the system, the way we are, our, our our system of governance is set up, uh, it it privileges the well to do. Uh, it helps to make sure that the people who are rich stay rich and get richer, and the the well being of the people who are. Uh, are are not wealthy, uh, who indeed in many respects are in need, tends to get treated as an afterthought. I don't know that that's that's central to uh, thinking about the use of military power, but it does seem to be one of the overarching truths uh, to our system. And indeed, again, referring back to this period after the Cold War ended, that occurred in spades with all the enthusiasm about globalization and how that was going to make everybody rich, didn't make everybody rich. It made some people very, very, very rich indeed. But of course, it exacerbated uh, the the gap between between the rich and everybody else 
so that that gap is larger today than it's probably since it's ever been, certainly that, that it's been since the uh, latter part of the 1800s. Well, I guess what I'm thinking of, and maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm thinking about the military too broadly, are, are things like um, you know the the Kissinger what was it the thirteen or the you know uh, um, uh, where we were projecting our power in, in in Central America and Latin America because of 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 corporate interests or um, uh, the you know uh, our involvement in the Middle East to a certain extent was also about at least maintaining. Um, um, you know, oil or or access to oil or preventing others from getting access to oil, which I guess can be seen in a, in a Cold War context, but also um, maybe that was uh, this is what I'm asking it is is was the that was the in part pretext of the day. Well, I mean, yes and no. <clears throat> I mean, I would certainly agree that. If you want to know how we, what, why we ended up defining uh, the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, as a vital U.S. national security interest, the one word answer to that question <clears throat> is oil. So that trying to ensure the continued flow of oil from the Persian Gulf has been the <clears throat> overarching rationale of U.S. policy, military policy in the region going back to uh, the Carter Doctrine. Of, uh, of, 19, of 1979, which really militarized U.S. policy in the region. That said, it seems to me that the emphasis on ensuring access to oil uh, reflects not simply a determination of people in power to enrich their chums, it also reflects the prevailing definition of freedom, of, of, of how our fellow citizens define what it means to be free. And that, sadly, uh, that definition tends to take the form of material interests. To be free, we believe, we collectively believe, to be free is to have a car that we can fill with cheap gas so that we can go wherever we want to go when we want to go there. And and that, it seems to me, also helps to explain uh, why the United States has gotten itself involved in this misbegotten uh, war uh, in the Persian Gulf. Now, the really interesting part is, of course, here in 2020, guess what? We don't need Persian Gulf oil to maintain the American way of life, but our policy elites haven't quite caught up to that fact. That is to say, they haven't caught up to the fact that that in a very concrete uh, uh, sense, the Persian Gulf really isn't, doesn't qualify as a vital U.S. national security interest. We need to reevaluate uh, how how important that part of the world is to us in substantive terms. And I think if we did so, we'd find that the, the rationale for maintaining the so-called global war on terrorism would evaporate. I mean, yeah, what what of that? Is that simply, I mean, I mean, like, you, I, I was aware that we get, you know, a, a fraction of uh, our domestic uh, um, uh, oil, or I should say oil that we use domestically from uh, that region. We get most of it from from the United States. Well, we, we, we could uh, get most of it from the United States. We get Canada, uh, Mexico. We could be we could be um, uh, perfectly free from that area. And obviously prices are fixed, you know, globally. But if we really were concerned about it, we, we could also just nationalize all our own resources um, and, and, and deal with it that way. Is that it or is, is part of it also just a desire to control the spigot? Uh, on some level, so that um, our, you know, rivals, China, uh, say, uh, don't have unfettered access to it? Well, I think I think I would have stopped that sentence with the word control. In other words, don't go to the spigot. What I mean by that is there is a mindset uh, within the foreign policy establishment in Washington dates back to World War II, certainly reinforced by the Cold War and by the end of the Cold War, an attitude that says we are the global leader. We are are somehow called upon uh, to to determine the future of global events Uh, and and that uh, maintaining a presence, uh, frequently military presence, in many parts of the world 
is the way we exercise that that leadership. Uh, and I think you can make a case that during the Cold War, uh, despite many errors along the way, like like Vietnam, that 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 there was some merit in that notion of of or that definition of American global leadership. I think that that rationale has evaporated uh, since the end of the Cold War. And this notion that we need to control, for example, the notion that we need to control what goes on in the part of the world inhabited by Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Iran has simply caused us to make catastrophic mistakes, costly to us, costly to the people that we are supposedly uh, liberating. Uh, and, and there is an enormous stubbornness uh, among elites in Washington to acknowledge the extent to which uh, our policies in that part of the world have yielded a, a disaster. President Trump said he understood that those policies had led to disaster, said he was going to get us out. And, of course, he has not done that. And, indeed, now I think it seems increasingly likely that he is going to replicate the errors in judgment of Obama and of George W. Bush and of Bill Clinton and so on. Uh, I want to get into to that in a more, but I just also want to touch on maybe the more general aspect of presidential command. You talk about the um, the eleventh commandment. You call it uh, the Decalogue plus one or D uh, D uh, plus one. Um, explain that to us, and 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 also uh, explain to us whether that comes from the like the the I guess the sort of just the it, there's there's a quality of like Congress just feeling mentally and emotionally overwhelmed and they don't want to have to process a, a lot of the things we just talked about. And so they just defer to the president. Well, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to be too harsh, but I think that really reflects uh, cowardice on the part of Congress, not a, not a re- Republican cowardice or a Democratic cowardice, a cowardice that has created an inclination, I should say a disinclination, uh, on the part of the Congress to fulfill its duties under the Constitution. And, of course, the things related to the war powers uh, are a classic example of that. Uh, so this, this, this deference to the commander-in-chief goes all the way back to World War II and to the earliest days of the Cold War when we, we, we persuaded ourselves that we needed to empower the president to blow up the world, you know, to push the button, uh, in order to keep ourselves safe. We could have a long argument about whether or not that made sense back in, let's say, 1949 or 1959, but it certainly doesn't make any sense uh, today, and therefore there's an urgent need to curtail uh, the authority of the, of the president to, to make war. And I think it's, it's only with uh, President Trump uh, in his uh, you know, sort of casual way of making decisions uh, that that there is now a a much livelier appreciation that this deference to the commander in chief uh, really has has been a mistake for a long long time. Yeah, I mean, what what do you think that that accounts for that in this day and age? I mean, I agree with you; it's cowardice, but it's also one that seems to be um, sort of almost distinct of 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 self-preservation. I mean, I'm thinking at least in terms of the, of the Democrats, right? I mean, because I mean, Republicans have not paid a price in supporting. Um, it, it, it seems to me now, I guess one could argue that uh, Jeb Bush, you know, paid a price maybe in the last, um, uh, the, the last Republican primary on some level because of, uh, of, of his brother's, um, uh, you know, war of choice. But uh, when I look at Democrats, I see, um, and maybe this is just my, you know, I'm not quite old enough to, to remember a time where it was different, but, you know, maybe McGovern still sort of like rules uh, in the, 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 the heads of, of Democrats. But, you know, I think of John Kerry um, and his failure to sort of like follow what I think was his natural inclination to vote against the Iraq war. Um, what, what, what accounts for that cowardice? Is it just, is it, is it, I mean, is it ultimately the, I mean, what, what accounts for that? Well, you know, if you take responsibility for something, then you're going to be held accountable for what the consequences were. Uh, so it's a lot easier uh, to foist the responsibility for making war onto the president 
uh, and then if things don't go away, you can go tut, 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 uh, what a mistake that was. But you don't really own it. Uh, I would disagree with you on, on the fact that prices have been paid. Remember, back in the uh, uh, off-year elections of 2006, uh, the American people did hold George W. Bush uh, responsible and elected a Democratic Congress. Uh, and, and that probably also explains one of the, at least one explanation for why Barack Obama uh, won the presidency in 2008. Mm-hmm. You know, he too, if you remember, uh, was denouncing stupid wars and promising to, to get out of them. Uh, fair enough. I mean, I, I sort of think the, the, the 2006 thing in retrospect may have been as much about, um, about uh, Mark Foley and, um, and and sort of the corruption amongst the Republicans. But I, I, I like to think part of it was at least uh, anti-war. But um, so where we have now seen um, there are war powers, new war powers resolutions uh, or acts, I guess, um, or resolutions based on the act introduced in the Senate by Tim Kaine and in the House by Barbara Lee and Ilhan Omar um, that sort of mirror one that uh, Sanders and Khanna had introduced some times back. Where, wh- What is the need for these resolutions? I mean, wh- is, it, is it to just sort of like, I don't know, spruce up the marker that theoretically is already there? I, I don't know, really. Uh, I mean, to some degree, it, it looks like posturing. Uh, you wonder if anything's going to really change. Uh, you know, if, it seems to me that if the Congress genuinely believed that the president was exceeding his authority in making war somewhere, that there is a, a solution readily available, and that's cut off the funding. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the Congress does, you know, this, the power of the purse is very substantial. Um, but the the think the reflex reaction of the Congress is to say, oh, my God, we don't want to be accused of not supporting the troops. Uh, and therefore, they continue to fund wars, even when a majority of members have concluded that the war is a stupid one. And therefore, the authority of the commander in chief to do whatever he wants remains intact. And, and of course, though, you know, we have now a precedent of the president moving funds from, um, you know, to, to appropriating yeah. funds for the, for the, for the yep. wall. In the this wall. Instance. Yep. I mean, yep. if he can, ge- no, it, it, if I they- think, I think it, w- it would be constitutionally complicated, uh, and controversial. I'm not trying to say that power of the purse equals, you know, we can, we can shut off a war between now and next Thursday, but it does seem to me that ultimately that's, that, that is, that defines the authority of the Congress. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, the, 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 the framers of the Constitution believed that uh, our system of three co-equal uh, uh, branches of government, that, the, that, the, that nonetheless, that, you know, the first among the equals in their judgment was the Congress. That's why it's Article I of the, of the Constitution describes the, the role of the Congress. It's only Article II that gets to the, talking about what the president can and cannot do. Um, well, I mean, what do you make of... I mean, I, I, I wonder how much sort of there are uh, more culprits in this in this day and age when, you know, I don't know, is it three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we get all of this, um, uh, you know, this this trove of information on Afghanistan that basically says yeah. we as a country have been lied to by our leaders for yep. uh, 15 years, 16, years, you know, like I'm, I, I'm trying to be generous and not say the entire 18. Um, but, uh, n- I, I mean, nobody's talking about it. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I, I must say one of the things that I'm most disappointed about, it was, there was a big flurry of interest, uh, when the Washington post uh, broke the story of the Afghanistan, uh, papers. Uh, I think that lasted about 72 hours. Yeah. Uh, and it already all, it quickly began to fade away because I think you're, you're exactly right here. Uh, th- that trove of documents uh, indicts uh, the entire national security apparatus. Democrats, Republicans, senior military officers, uh, there was a, a pattern, probably continues to be a pattern, of, of deception and dishonesty. We were lied to. Uh, how could that have happened? Well, I mean, again, as I think there's a, there's, a, there's a short version of the story and the long version. I think the long version is more important, and that is that 
going back to World War II and through the Cold War, uh, the American people came to believe that that the experts, uh, whether they were people working in the White House or they were generals working in the Pentagon, that the, the experts had the best interests of the country at heart, and they knew what they were doing, that they were competent. You know, I'm a sort of Vietnam-era guy, and if there's anything we should have learned from Vietnam is that the people who were supposedly smarter than the rest of us weren't smarter. I mean, the people who blundered into Vietnam, the people who, who insisted upon continuing that war long after it became apparent uh, that it was a, 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 an act of folly, they got away with it. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about the McNamara's and the McGeorge Bundy's and the, the William Westmoreland's and, and, and on and on. Uh, one might have thought that the Vietnam War would have created a sense of skepticism in the American public about an, uh, an unwillingness to defer and to trust to people who claim to be experts. But that, if, 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 that, if that skepticism existed, it faded away quickly. Where, where did it, I mean, it, it, it seems to have faded away from every possible sector that it could have existed. I mean, on some level, I would have imagined the skepticism would have been um, most institutionalized within the context of the military on some level. Maybe, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I have no experience within that institution, but it, at least there's like some type of, of framework like presumably where there's institutional memory. Uh, but w I just watched a clip today of, uh, of Mark Milley, who is the, uh, as you know, the, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying, I don't believe really any of this stuff in those Afghanistan papers because it would involve some type of like broad conspiracy when to me it would all just have to be that everybody agrees we're just going to be cowardly and do exactly what you had just mentioned earlier, which is not be the, the, the thumb that sticks out and tell the truth. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the military is a hierarchy, uh, and in any hierarchy, <clears throat> there are incentives to uh, play along uh, so that you can make your way up toward the top of the greasy pole. Uh, military service does not encourage uh, original thinking. Uh, it tends to demand conformity. Uh, and I think that you know, it's the younger officers who, who, very interestingly, are the ones who have the have the critical take on Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, it's the senior officers say, who say, well, "Geez, I didn't see anything wrong. We're a bunch of smart guys doing the best we can." Uh, so that's that's part of the problem, I think. Well, where do you think this? I mean, we are on the verge of of perhaps, and and I don't know. I mean, if you have an assessment. Um, that is, you know, uh, I'd be curious as to your assessment as to what what is actually going on with this um, assassination. And I noticed you called it an assassination of uh, uh, Soleimani. Um, wh what is your assessment of it? I mean, uh, you know, I I've heard different differing theories that uh, just this has been a long term project for Pompeo and and having um, uh, Millie in there and Espers, who is a, a Raytheon executive. They were, you know, there was a sort of a unified front in, in pushing this. Or I've also heard theories that maybe this was a mistake and they didn't realize that Suleimani was there and they were just going after uh, Muhandis, I think, who was the um, the Iraqi militia leader who was part of the incursion to the U.S. Embassy. What, what is your assessment of, of what's happening there and of the ability of of our I mean, uh, uh, of uh, of what the agenda is of the White uh, of the administration really here? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, first of all, I don't know. Uh, but my my guess is that uh, in these kind of matters, the uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're going to go into the Oval Office. They're going to say, Mr. Mr. President, we think we need to act. And here's here are the five options that we recommend you consider. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, typically, uh, it's, it's, it's the middle one. It's the one that's not too hot or not too cold uh, that the bureauc bureaucracy wants the president to choose. I think in this case, he surprised everybody by choosing the one that was way too hot. Uh, neither the president uh, nor his advisors had thought through uh, 
about consequences. What happens next? Where does this where does this leave us? How does this uh, somehow advance the well-being of our country? So they killed this guy, and uh, and in doing so, of course, they surrendered the initiative to uh, the Iranian uh, government to decide what's going to happen next. And here we are waiting with bated breath uh, to find out how Iran is going to react. I mean, they have reacted to some degree, uh, in a condemnation, pulling out of what remained of the uh, Iran uh, nuclear deal. Uh, there was a broad expectation that there's going to be some kind of a violent act. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case. My own guess would be that there will be, but it won't be direct. It won't. There won't. The, the, the Iranians are not stupid. They're not going to sort of directly attack the United States or even U.S. forces. They're going to launch an attack that is indirect or oblique, or maybe an attack in which their own role will be somewhat disguised, and therefore it'll be uh, create complications uh, for Bush and his advisors. Excuse me, Trump, uh, Trump and his advisors. Uh, in trying to figure out uh, how to formulate a response. And they don't need to do it tomorrow. I mean, they, 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 the initiative is theirs. They can wait patiently. Uh, they can calculate, which President Bush does not do, uh, and, and, and come up with the answer that they think makes sense. doesn't mean it's going to be a good answer, a, a sensible answer. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're sort of in the wait-and-see mode now, I think. What do you make of uh, of of Mike Pence coming out and saying that um, Suleiman helped ten of the men who would carry out the nine eleven attacks? I mean, I, I think I think there's no evidence to support that. Uh, just like there's no evidence to support his claim uh, with with the Iraqi Parliament having uh, said they want U.S. forces out of the country, Pence goes on TV and says, "I know that the Iraqi people want us to stay." I mean, the, the arrogance is breathtaking. Well, it seems to me that there's it's worse than there's no evidence of that. There's, you know, we have a 9-11 report. To the extent that we have evidence, we have all the evidence points in the other direction. I mean, it'd be one thing, you know, to say, like, I think the Iraqi people want X, Y, or Z, and we haven't taken a poll. But if we had a, a dozen polls that said the Iraqi people want A, and I say they want B, uh, I, I don't know. It seems to me he's lying. He's just lying. I, I think that would have. I think that's an accurate characterization. Yeah. Let me let me just ask you one final question here. They go in and they present Donald Trump with the uh, you know, here's the five options. Is there nobody in this process who is like, and here's the you know two paragraphs we've written on the implications of these choices or what we would do afterwards? Like, is it just here's the way that we can react? Is there nobody who's presenting him with like, and incidentally, this is what, this is the logical sort of next steps that happen if we act that way? Yeah, nor normally there would be. Uh, doesn't mean that the analysis would necessarily be sound, but there would be analysis. That's what, as best we can tell as outsiders, you know, outside observers, right. uh, it doesn't appear that that's the way this president uh, operates. In other words, he's not interested in some subordinate's ideas of how a particular action could play out. He, he's a, he's a gut level kind of guy. Uh, you know, he, he, he operates on instinct and on impulse. Uh, and that's his MO. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's exceedingly dangerous, uh, but I don't know that anybody has found a way to uh, cur curtail uh, that inclination on his part. Um, uh, lastly, you know, you've, you, this has been something, I mean, you've obviously been thinking about these questions for a long time, uh, and, and been talking about it and writing about them. What, what is, what, is there one element of society that's going to have to sort of, um, lead this charge? Is there one that's uniquely situated? Like, how do we get out of this, uh, seemingly never ending, uh, um, I guess, progression through this sort of never ending war? Well, it's got to be the American people. And that's not going to be the, the Washington establishment. It's not going to be the military that's going to say, hey, wait a second. We now realize we've been going in the wrong direction and we want to change course radically. And in many respects, I believe, in my book, I argue uh, that the 2016 election was, in fact, a repudiation of those stupid ideas that shaped U.S. policy during the post-Cold War era. Remember, 
particularly on the, on the matter of war, that candidate Trump said, yes, our never-ending wars are stupid. Elect me. I will end them. Uh, and I think that was a major factor in why he got elected in the first place. Sadly, he has not been able to follow through on what he promised, and I think he hasn't in large part because he doesn't know how. I mean, he, he's not capable of sophisticated analysis, uh, careful follow-through. And so we get decisions like this one to assassinate the, the Iranian general, and then we all sit around trying to figure out what the consequences are. Is there a candidate today that, uh, that you see that may be um, uh, running that, is, that, that represents um, uh, a similar opportunity, but maybe one that's not as um, devoid of any uh, capacity to execute? You know, I don't think I'm in a position to evaluate all the Democratic challengers. I mean, I'm just sort of amazed that there's so many of them that are still in the race that we haven't, that the Democrats haven't been able to reduce the field down to, you know, two or three. Where then we could kind of make that careful examination of, of the individual's ability to, you know, think, the individual's uh, temperament. Uh, I just don't think we're there yet. And I, I say that with great regret. You don't think Sanders represents that? I mean, I, mean, I just, it, 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 at the very least in the context of, of, of uh, this attack on Suleiman, and, and, and broadly speaking, I mean, um, to the extent that there has been a, you know, I mean, he's introduced, um, he, he, we have five senators running in the race, or at one point we did, and, and uh, they all had the opportunity to introduce a, a war powers uh, resolution. Sanders was the only one who did it. Um, hey, go, going, going back to 2016, when he was uh, challenging Hillary Clinton, it was clear uh, that his approach to using military power was going to be far more prudent and reasoned uh, than was Hillary Clinton's. Uh, and so in that sense, yeah, I think, I think many of the things that Sen Senator Sanders says, is uh, uh, they make sense to me. Uh, but I, I frankly don't know if he's electable. Uh, and that's not my call anyway. So we'll just see how that plays out. Indeed. Um, Andrew Basevich, the book is The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War uh, Victory. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.